for the interest of time, uh, uh, we, we can probably start. So today we are um, very, very happy to have Avram uh, Bloom from uh, TTIC. Uh, he's the chief uh, academic officer uh, there uh, and uh, for two, three years now? Uh, four actually. Four years, okay, yeah. Because of COVID, everything is very I know Larry, right? So, uh, but he has been at uh, you know before that he was at CMU for twenty five years, has done many many interesting work, uh, you know, at the interface of theoretical computer science, machine learning, and today he's going to give uh, he's going to give a talk about you know learning in the presence of biased data. So the floor is yours. Great, thank you. So it's uh, thank you for the invitation and the introduction. It's great to be here virtually, wish I could be there in person. Um, yeah, I'm gonna be talking about uh, two pieces of work that together are joint with uh, Saba Ahmadi, Hedya Bayagi, uh, Kazia Nagita, and Kevin Stengel. Um, having to do with learning in, in the presence of biased data and strategic behavior. So, uh, good. so the, uh, the first uh, topic I wanna to talk about is, has to do with fairness and biased data. And uh, let me just to give a one slide version of this, this part. So usually in discussing fairness in machine learning, we tend to think of a trade-off between fairness and accuracy or between different fairness constraints that we might care about. Um, but what I wanna think about here is what happens if our training data is biased? Uh, in that case, could it be that fairness constraints actually lead to improved performance even if all we care about is accuracy. Now, right, normally constraining an optimization problem can only make things worse, but if you're optimizing the wrong thing, then you know, maybe those constraints can help. And this is motivated by work of Kleinberg and Raghavan on similar questions in the context of ranking and by Hart Price three row fairness notions. So what I'm gonna do here is we're gonna posit some simple bias scenarios and examine whether existing fairness notions might help or hurt under these scenarios. Okay, so, uh, so just to talk kind of brief introduction to fairness in machine learning. So uh, algorithms increasingly are being used to automate or advise decisions that impact people. Um, you know, things like whether to be approved for a loan, to be admitted to college, to be hired for a job, uh, bail and parole decisions. And you know, it's generally agreed that it would be a big problem if these algorithms were systematically biased against some say racial or ethnic or gender group. And this you know, really hit the fore with uh, some years ago, this Compass example of this Compass software for predicting recidivism used as an aid in bail and parole decisions. And it takes can class candidates and it classifies them as being low risk or high risk. And an analysis of data from a county in Florida showed that, um, that black defendants uh, who were not rearrested within the next two years uh, were nearly twice as likely to have been classified as high risk compared to their white counterparts. And uh, uh, white defendants who were rearrested over the next uh, two years had been labeled low risk almost twice as often as, as their black counterparts. And if we want to kind of think of this using uh, you know, machine learning or, or data science terminology, let, let's think of somebody who you know, stays clean, they're not rearrested as a positive example, and someone who does get rearrested as a negative example. And let's think of a, this classifier is make, trying to make predictions. So classifying someone as low risk is predicting that they're gonna be positive, um, and classifying them as high risk is predicting that they're gonna be negative. So this first bullet is saying that the, the uh, false uh, negative rate, the, 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 the chance of being classified or predicted you know, high risk negative, uh, given that you're actually uh, positive, is twice as high for the black defendants as white defendants, whereas the false positive rate is it's the other way around. And so this you know, is concerning. Um, a subsequent analysis 
showed that, uh, it, uh, on the other hand, that the compass system is calibrated. So of those it calls high risk, there's about a 75% rearrest rate across both groups. Of those it calls low risk, about a 30% rearrest rate. So what's happening here is the probability of the true value given the predicted values are similar, but the other way around, the probability of predicted value given the true values are not. Um, and so this led to you know, a lot of sort of discussion and you know, is this fair, is it not fair? What do we mean by fair? And, and I think uh, in a lot of really interesting work trying to, to make some definitions of what is it that we might want. Um, so so what I want, that's what I want to do next, just talk about, so, so what are some things that we might want? So let's kind of just, to, let, let's think of, say, applying to a college or for hiring or applying for a loan where the, the folks applying would like to be classified as positive because that'll um, mean they, they get in, they get hired, they get the loan. And so one thing you might want is, uh, called uh, by Hart, Price, and Cerebro, equality of opportunity. And so this definition will say that a predictor or a classifier satisfies equality of opportunity with respect to a set of groups. If the, the probability of, predict, of the, the classifier predicting positive, given that you're a true positive, if those are approximately the same across the groups. Okay, so the way to think of this is that, you know, if, if you really would be a good student, a good employee, or a good borrower, you should have the same chance of being admitted or hired or approved, regardless of which group you belong to. So, okay, so that's called equality of opportunity. Uh, a, a stronger version of this called equalized odds says, well, in addition, we want the same on the negative. So if you would not be a good student or employee or borrower, then you also should have the same chance of being admitted or not, regardless of your group. And then you might ask, well, you know, is it generally possible to satisfy these or are these vacuous? And, and certainly it is possible to satisfy them. There are some trivial ways. So predicting everybody positive, so letting everyone in would satisfy quality of opportunity and equalized odds. Similarly, predicting everyone negative, letting nobody in, predicting everyone randomly, letting a random 10% of the population in, and importantly, predicting everyone correctly would indeed satisfy both of these conditions because then the, the things we care about would be 100%. Okay. Um, another thing you, you might want is what's called calibration. So we say that a predictor is calibrated with respect to a set of groups if the probability of uh, being a true positive conditioned on being predicted positive and the probability of being a true negative conditioned on being predicted negative, if those are approximately the same across the groups. So one way to think of this is the meaning of predicting positive or negative. Kind of what's the chance? If I if I predict positive, you know, what's the chance they really are going to be a good student, a good employee, and so forth? That that should be about the same across the groups. So that's called calibration. Okay. And then the one more that I want to just bring up is called demographic parity. Uh, predictor satisfies demographic parity with respect to a set of groups. Um, if the probability of predicting positive is about the same across the group. So uh, if you're going to admit 10% of the applicants from group A, you should also admit 10% of the applicants from group B. So that would be called demographic parity. Okay. And many of these can be in conflict with each other. Um, okay. So, but what I want to talk about is not so much, you know, which of these is the, you know, we, sort of morally want in a given situation, but um, what can we say about their ability to address bias training data? So a commonly cited reason for bias in classifiers is the idea that you know, often training data can be biased and then you train on it and that kind of gets baked into the classifier. Um, and so the angle I'd like to take is instead of arguing about which fairness notion is sort of morally right, uh, let's consider natural ways that training data could be biased. And let's see if these constraints could actually improve accuracy uh, or on the flip side, herd accuracy of the classifier produced. And that might give you know, more motivation for uh, considering the ones that would improve accuracy if, you know, especially for a decision maker, where maybe that's mostly focused on accuracy. Okay. Um, and so this, yeah, this would give additional motivation for this uh, fairness notion. And one caveat I'd like to make right up front is I'm going to be making a number of assumptions, some that are realistic, some that are less so, on both 
the way the data is biased and on the ground truth target function being learned. So, you know, this is just a step, but there's a lot more one could do. Uh, I'm not going to claim that all the assumptions I'm making are necessarily, you know, realistic, but we're going to, you know, some, make some assumptions and then see where we go. Okay, so first of all, the setting. We're going to be considering a case of two groups, A and B. Call A the, think of A as the advantage group and B as the disadvantage group. Okay, so here they are. Uh, the groups are disjoint, so everyone is a member of one or the other and not both. Uh, we'll assume that membership is observable, so we have that information. And we're trying to do some kind of binary classification, you know, who gets approved for a loan, who gets hired, who gets admitted, that kind of thing. Okay, so um, you know, something like this. So in this picture here, um, let's think of a blue points are the points that are actually positive. The green points are the points that are actually negative. This red line here is our classifier. It's not perfect, but in this case, it's pretty good. It makes a couple of mistakes of class. You know, there's a few green points that misclassifies as positive, a few blue points that misclassifies as negative, but it's a pretty good classifier. Okay, so that's the setting we're in. Uh, we'll imagine that there are some true distributions, DA on group A, DB on group B, and that these could be different. And so, uh, you know, maybe this is for group A, this is for group B. They could be somewhat different distributions. It could be that the optimal classifiers for the two groups are actually different. And it could be that our, our learning algorithm, yeah, because it can see uh, group membership, or even if it can't, maybe there's enough features it can sort of figure it out, might learn a classifier that behaves differently on group A and group B. Um, okay, and, and, and maybe you actually do want to behave differently because maybe the, the, maybe the Bayes optimal classifiers are different, or maybe they're the same. And then the overall distribution is a mixture of these two. Say R is the, um, is the, the fraction of the population that's in group B, so the overall Distribution is one minus R times TA plus R times TA. And then what is our algorithm gonna do? Our algorithm is gonna perform uh, ERM empirical risk minimization, namely just gonna try to find the classifier in the family it has of, of, of least error on the training sample, possibly subject to fairness constraints. Okay, and then we're gonna see kind of what it does. And I, let me mention, I'm gonna be working in the, the large sample limit. So I'm, I'm not gonna be worrying about kind of what's the, the usual difference between you know, empirical error and generalization error uh, that you get with, with small samples. There, there, there will be a, a difference that comes from our bias models, but I'm gonna be thinking in the large sample limit. So we don't have to worry about one thing at a time. Uh, certainly it'd be interesting to look at these in a smaller sample setting, but we look in the large sample limit. Okay. So that's the high level setting. Now let me talk about bias models. So I'm going to you know, talk about a few bias models. Um, I'm going to introduce some, you know, some parameters. Don't worry, you don't have to remember them. I'll, I'll kind of always say what they are when I, when I use them. So the first uh, bias model uh, I want to think about is what we call underrepresentation bias. In this model, what's happening is in our training data, uh, it's a model where in the training data, group B shows up less. So group B shows up less in the training data than its true prevalence in the population. And moreover, and this is important, that this rate might differ to, for positive examples and negative examples. And that's what's going to make it more challenging. So formally, the model will look like this. You draw your x, y pair, x is the that the point Y is the label from your mixture distribution D. If X is, belongs to A, you keep it with probability one. If X belongs to B, then uh, for positive examples, you keep it with some probability beta plus, which, and for negative examples, you keep it with some other probability beta minus. And the interesting case here is gonna be when beta plus is smaller than beta minus. So what's happening is that the, the positive examples from group B are really showing up even less than, than the negative examples are compared to their true rates. And, and so why might that happen? Well, for instance, if your organization historically is not say admitted or, or hired you know, that many folks from group B, you know, they might not apply so much. And moreover, the, the positives might have you know, more other options than the negatives. So maybe the negatives you know, apply anyway because they don't have as many other options. Whereas the, the positives, the, the, uh, they have, you know, they have a bunch of other options, and so they they they, they go to their other options and don't apply. Okay, so that could easily be that this beta plus is much smaller than the beta minus. Okay, so that's one model. Uh, second model, um, 
uh, we call labeling bias. Uh, here, uh, what's happening is uh, people are showing up, but uh, the positive examples of group B are mislabeled as negative in the training data with some probability new. So, you know, maybe, you know, some of these, you know, uh, positive examples, uh, each one independently with some probability new was mislabeled as negative in your training data. So how might that happen? Well, it, it might, where did your label data come from? It, it came from perhaps people doing the labeling, maybe past hiring managers and so forth, and maybe they were biased and that kind of got baked into your training data. So that we'll call that labeling bias. And so formally, yeah, you draw a labeled example from your mixed distribution. If it's from A, you leave it alone. If it's from B and it's a positive example, just flip that label to negative and with probability new and stick it. And so that's what your training data looks like. Okay, so that's, those are two models. And then we can look at both of them together. All right, so those will be the bias models I'm gonna focus on. Uh, you could certainly consider many others, but these are just two clean ones that are interesting to think about. Okay, so now, um, given that, um, let's, uh, I need one, one more thing is to look at assumptions about the ground truth classifier. Um, and kind of before I say formally kind of what I want to assume, just a couple of guiding principles. Uh, one is uh, I want to be able to consider cases where there's no perfect classifier uh, in the, the family we're looking at. Um, uh, okay, there's a question. How do you tell if there's any labeling bias? So uh, these are just models for what's happening. Uh, it, the algorithm is not going to tell. Or it's just going to be doing, you know, doing its thing. It, so it's not going to be able to sort of say, oh, there's some labeling bias or anything like that. And we're just going to make these assumptions on how the data came in. Good question. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. So. Um, so first of all, I want to consider cases where there's no perfect classifier. If there's a perfect classifier in your family, then underrepresentation bias is not so interesting in the large sample limit. So you don't get so many Bs, you don't get so many positive Bs, but as long as you get some, you know, as the data set goes to infinity, you'll still learn the same thing. Uh, the second thing is I want to assume at the Bayes optimal classifier, in this case, these red lines, these red lines are always going to be the Bayes optimal classifiers in our family. So just think of, think of, you know, we're learning linear separators, but it doesn't have to be that, but think of it that way. And these are our Bayes optimal classifiers. I want them to satisfy all the fairness conditions we've discussed over the true unbiased distribution. If you don't have that, then we'll have created this sort of intrinsic conflict at the very start. And I, and I kind of want to put them all on the level playing field before we start, you know, before we say, hey, what happens when your training data is biased? Okay. So, uh, okay, so those are the guiding principles. So with that, let me now tell you what I actually going to assume and, and you could certainly argue, is this reasonable, not reasonable. Um, so specifically, I want to assume the following. So first of all, I'm going to assume that there are these Bayes optimal classifiers, uh, HA star and HB star. So this, this guy here is HA star, and this is here is HB star. Uh, and uh, in our family, and uh, such that for any example, um, the true label is equal to the prediction of this classifier with some probability one minus eta and is the opposite with some probability eta, where eta is something less than a half. So, so these are indeed Bayes optimal classifiers. Um, and when I'm assuming here, I guess two things. Uh, one is that, okay, they have this intrinsic error rate eta. And the second thing is I'm assuming that the errors are uniformly distributed. You know, every point that, that has this eta chance that its, it's true label is, is different from what we're predicting. And those are uniformly distributed. Now you could certainly argue that that's, you know, maybe not realistic. It could be that you have clusters of errors in some place or somewhere else, or that maybe points closer to your decision boundary, or you can have more errors there and maybe less farther from the decision boundary. Here, we're gonna be assuming that the errors are, are uniformly distributed all around. Okay, so that's certainly an assumption, but, but we're gonna make it. Okay, um, good. So the second thing is I want to assume that um, uh, for both groups, 
the Bayes optimal classifier predicts positive on a p fraction of members of the group. Okay, so that the world looks like this, a p fraction of points are above the line and a one minus p fraction are below the line. This is for the unbiased data and that's true for both groups. So what I'm assuming here is that the Bayes optimal classifier satisfies demographic parity. Okay, so that, so that you know, um, if we didn't have to worry about bias in the training data, demographic parity would be, would be fine. Um, the Bayes optimal classifier would classify a p fraction of, of group A as positive and a p fraction of group B as positive. Okay, so the assumptions that uh, made so far, okay, so first of all, HA star and HP star really are Bayes optimal classifiers under these assumptions. Um, uh, moreover, uh, they are calibrated. So the assumptions say the probability that say your label is true label is positive conditioned on predicting positive is one minus eta. And that's the same for both groups. So, so this part here uh, guarantees us that. Uh, so over the unbiased data, uh, these guys are calibrated. And moreover, if we apply Bayes rule, uh, they also satisfy equalized odds and equality of opportunity. So for example, the, the probability that, that you predict positive given your true positive. So basically we're asking, you know, what fraction of the blue points are above the line? Well, what fraction of blue points are above the line? Well, it's, it's the probability of the and, namely is the P probability of being above the line times the one minus eta chance you're blue given you're above the line divided by the same thing, plus, you know, one minus P fraction below the line times an eta chance you're blue given you're below the line. Okay, so, so those are the same for both groups. So the Bayes optimal classifiers satisfy all these conditions before we start introducing the bias to sort of put everything on a you know, fair playing field. Okay, good. So, so those are the assumptions. Now let's see what happens. So what happens with underrepresentation bias? So let's think of the beta minus as one. So all the group B negatives show up and we just start turn a knob, reducing beta plus from one down to zero. So positives from group B just start not showing up. So what does that look like? So we start like this and then, you know, and some positives from group B, you know, don't show up. Okay, and then as we make beta plus get even smaller, maybe some more positives from group B don't show up and so on. And if you look at just ERM all by itself, so just minimizing error on the data, it will actually do the right thing and it will keep doing the right thing until this beta plus gets so small, like I think where I put it now, uh, well, a little more, one, two, three, okay, I guess we do a little more until, um, uh, until finally, the positive region of, of this HB star actually starts looking more negative than positive, at which point it's gonna go over here and just classify all of group B as negative. So it'll kind of do the right thing until you know, enough positives from group B don't show up and then just say, you know what, actually even that side is ne more negative than positive. And so the, the ERM classifier will just label all of B as negative. Okay, but until that point, it'll actually do the right thing. Okay, so that's what's gonna happen with the unconstrained ERM. Now, what does calibration do? So let's again imagine that okay, some of these positives from group B don't show up. So interestingly, even if it's just a, a, a few positives that don't show up, so ERM is still doing the right thing, calibration will actually start forcing the classifiers to change because it's trying to match the probability of true minus given predicted minus and probability of true plus given predicted plus. So what's it trying to do? It's trying to match how green is the region below the boundary and how blue is the region above the boundary. And notice that right now, the region below the boundary is more green on the B side and less green on the A side. And the only way to fix that is for it to move the classifier up on the B side. And, and, and whereas on the, on the on the uh, positive side, notice that the classifier is more blue on the A side than it is on the B side. And the only way to fix that is for it to move this classifier down. So calibration, as you start making the, the training data bias this way, is going to force the classifiers to move the, on the B one to move up and the A one to move down. So it's going to reduce accuracy. And in addition, it's going to penalize B. I mean, okay, I said we weren't going to care about kind of, you know, sort of the, the moral value of this fairness notions, but, but it is actually going to P 
penalize B by forcing the classifier to, to admit you know, less of the B, fewer of the Bs and, and more of the A's. It's gonna reward the A's because it's trying to match these, you know, how blue is the region above the line, how green is the region below the line. So, so every, I just have a question. So when you say ERM, you assume that there is a hypothesis class, right? That you run ERM over. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to be assuming there's some family, uh, uh, say linear separators or whatever, some family. And, uh, and yeah. here, I guess you do not assume that the base classifier is a member. Or you do assume. Uh, I, 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 so actually, the assumptions I've made do, do give you that. So okay. I'm going to assume that these H A star and H B star, they belong to the family. Okay. And the assumptions that I made on the earlier slide here uh, do actually give you that, that H A star and H B star really are the ERM, sorry, really are the Bayes optimal classifier. The Bayes, right, okay. So right. you that's, can actually- that's, This assumption is giving us that. Right, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, Good. they're not perfect. So there is no perfect classifier. There is no perfect, but Bayes classifier is actually, you can get it by ERM. Yes, that's right, that's right. So, so yeah. Yeah, other questions? Okay, good. So it's interesting that calibration will actually start making things worse, you know, even when ERM by itself would be doing fine uh, because it's really trying to match. So it's really trying to bake in that bias in, into the, the things it's learning. Uh, demographic parity, what will it do? So demographic, par demographic parity as these pauses are not showing up because you have a higher fraction of the folks show, not showing up are above the line than below the line because it's the pauses and most of the pauses are above the line. It's going to, it, so, so this no longer satisfies demographic parity. It's got to move this classifier down so that we have a P, if it's a P fraction of A was above the line, we need a P fraction of B to be below the line. So this will be kind of helpful for people in group B, but it's, it's going to reduce accuracy. On the other hand, equality of opportunity and equalized odds will actually allow HA star and HB star to go through unchanged because the probability of predicting positive given you're a true positive. So let me go back to the setting here again. So what is that? It's the fraction, it's given that you're a blue point, what's the chance you're above the line? That stayed the same. And the reason is that our bias model says the chance you apply, the chance you're in the training data is a function of your, 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 your true label, whether you're blue or green, not what the classifier says. And so the blue points that are not showing up, they're distributed the same as the blue points that are showing up and they're all just distributed the same as the, all the blue points. So given that you're a blue point and you showed up, still same chance you're above or below the line. So um, equality of opportunity equalized odds under these bias models still allow the Bayes optimal classifiers to go through. And moreover, you can show they will actually lock in the Bayes optimal classifier. So even if you have lots of positives, say not showing up in group B, and so maybe you know ERM gets to the point where it would like to classify all of B as negative, it can't do that because that would force it to also classify all of A as negative. And as long as, I mean, unless your parameters are so skewed that it says, I'm gonna classify everybody in the world as negative, the fact that it wants to do the right thing on group A is going to force it to do the right thing on group B because your constraints are, are locking in that, hey, if, if A has a certain fraction of you know, blues are above the line and a certain fraction below, B's has to match the same. It's, so it will lock in the correct classifiers for all beta plus greater than zero. So that's kind of interesting. So at the point where ERM would kind of give up on the B's, um, the both of these constraints will force it to, to, to do the right thing on the V's because it has to match what it's doing on the A's. Okay, so that's, that's this underrepresentation bias. Okay, now what about labeling bias? So labeling bias here, we have everyone showing up, but just you know some fraction of your positives were mislabeled as negative in your training data. So again, ERM in this case will do the right thing. It'll produce H star, A star, H, B star until your noise rate is high enough. So I think at the point I have it right now where the area above the line is you know, equally positive and negative or slightly more negative, in which case, again, it's gonna classify all of group B as negative. Um, equality of opportunity will continue to lock in uh, the correct Bayes optimal classifiers. Um, 
demographic parity actually will also in this case, because we, we, we haven't thrown out any points, we've just mislabeled them and, and, and you can argue, you, you can you can show that it'll actually lock them in. Um, because these these quantities are not affected by the labeling bias. And so it allows them, and then you can show that, okay, the only, you know, doing ERM subject to these constraints will actually stick with, it'll actually find you your HA star and HB star and the infinite sample limit. Um, again, unless your, your, your parameters are so off that it says, I'm just gonna label everybody in the world as negative. Um, unfortunately, the probability of predicting true given your true negative, so the distribution, how the greens look has changed because these circled points now look green to the classifier, so it thinks that it's that the negatives have, have, have a different distribution, and so uh, these will no longer satisfy equalized odds in the train data, so equalized odds actually is going to start forcing your classifiers to be different. Um, and calibration will continue to force your classifier to favor group A and hurt group B in order to try to equalize its, um, the things it's trying to equalize. You know, so basically you know, in this setting, it's trying to say, hey, I, I want the amount of blueness above the line to match. And right now the B region is not looking as blue above the line as the A's. And so it'll force the classifier to let it, to, to move the classifier down, let in more green you know, A's and, and likewise push up the, the B's. Okay, and if you put them both together, then equality of opportunity will actually continue to lock in your HA star and HB star um, until the bias is so overwhelming, the ERM would rather classify everybody as negative uh, and the others will, will, will fail. So kind of the takeaway message, okay, from, from this, so we, we, what do we do? We, I said, hey, here are some bias models. Here are some assumptions on the ground truth. And under these, well, first of all, I think the main one is just that fairness constraints can have different impacts on accuracy when your training data is biased. So the impact really depends on the constraint you have. And in these models, you know, and, and you could argue whether these are, you know, are these good models or good assumptions or not. But in these assumptions, uh, we find that equality of opportunity is particularly helpful. It helps us lock in the thing that we're looking for, whereas calibration is actually particularly problematic because it's, it's, it's forcing uh, the bias in the train data to be reflected in the, in the classifier, even when the ERM wouldn't have done that on its own. Okay, so, so kind of to summarize this part one of the talk here, so these are stylized models of of, of both sort of the correct labeling function and how data is biased, but I think they give an interesting way to compare fairness notions. These particular results give another motivation for using equality of opportunity, namely that uh, if training data is biased in these ways, it can improve accuracy of, of the classifier you're producing because it's kind of forcing you to get those basophile classifiers, even when your training data is biased. Of course, these are highly stylized models and a lot more you know, one could do. Okay, so that's kind of part one. I'm gonna now move on to something kind of completely different, but uh, not completely. Uh, so can I also ask the, again, sure. coming back to the base um, classifier. So let's say that the base classifier has all the good properties, but it's not in the class. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, well, I, I so, um, right. So then things could be different. So. In the, the way the, um, uh, maybe I guess what was happening in this model. So as we said, we're assuming that, that there exists in this say these linear separators or whatever they are, where, you know, functions in the class where the errors are kind of uniformly distributed around. Right. If you imagine that they weren't uniformly distributed, there might be some pocket where you actually, your error rate is now bigger than 50%. Right. So let, let's call, let's say these are the Bayes optimal within the class, right? Mm -hmm. These are the, the best linear separators. Um, what, so, so the way what you're saying could happen is there could be some pocket, like maybe the error rates are not uniformly distributed. There's some pocket where your error rate is actually, you know, 70%. So really you would like to reclassify that pocket. You just can't give, given these functions. Yeah. So that would certainly lead to different scenarios. So we actually are very highly, you know, using the fact that the errors are uniformly distributed. If, if they weren't, and you could even have a case where the Bayes optimal classifiers are in the class, but your errors are you know, not uniformly distributed, mm -hmm. then, then you know, these results, they wouldn't hold as strongly as they do. So uh, yeah, so I certainly, I think that gets into the stylizedness of the models and, and into, so let me just set, 
much more to be done. <laughs> so, so I think great question. You know, I'd be interested to see what what kind of answers we can get. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. So so now now I want to turn to a kind of a, a similar setup in a way, but a different sort of question. And so this is uh, work, work on strategic online classification. So the setting here is we're now going to be interested in kind of, we were looking before at sort of um, uh, the bias is coming from how data is labeled. Here, it's coming in a different way. We are, we are, this is sort of a more classic, maybe economics, management, you know, game theoretic setting where we are classifying entities that, that care about how they are classified. And so those entities would like to modify how they look in order to get a positive classification. Okay, so you want to, um, you're trying to decide who gets a loan, who gets admitted and so forth. And we're going to have a model where agents can change a bit how they appear, their features, because they want to be classified positive. So if they can take out an extra credit card or, or kind of, I don't know, put something on their, on their CV that, you know, it, it looks nice. Something that doesn't actually change whether they are really loan worthy or, you know, really would be a good student, but just makes them kind of look better. If they can do it, they will. Okay, so we're gonna have a model where agents can modify their feature values to some limited extent. And we're gonna be looking at this in an online setting. So previously it was a distributional setting. Now it's gonna be agents coming one at a time. And the challenge here is going to be that um, agents are going to be responding to what your current decision rule is. So as you learn, you might modify what you're doing. And then as you modify what you're doing, then new agents are going to respond to the new rule and they're going to change how they, you know, how they uh, manipulate, how they change their features. And so it's going to be this um, kind of a, a dynamic aspect of things. And this is particularly a challenge in the online learning setting where there's no distribution. So if there was a distribution and you sort of had a training phase where you could just collect like clean data, maybe you have some initial phase where you admit everyone or reject everyone. So no one has any incentive to, to, to modify their true features since it's not gonna matter. And then you get some clean data and you figure out what to do and you, and you could figure out, okay, so now, now what do I need to do? I need to, you know, um, uh, I, I need to shift over things in some way because people are going to be modifying things and so forth. But in, in this online setting without a distribution, there's no, there's no way to collect clean data. So there's, you're always going to be having people reacting to what you're currently doing. Okay. So um, yeah, it's like online learning of a Stackelberg leader strategy because we're basically we're going first and then the uh, agents will be responding. Okay, and, and this is sometimes called measure management, this sort of general scenario that, you know, if you're going to be paying people or making decisions based on things that they can control that, you know, you know quantities that uh, uh, various measures that they can control, well, they're, they're going to adjust those measures so that, you know, they, they look good according to whatever it is you're, you're measuring. Okay, so here's formally the model that I want to look at. Um, so we'll look at binary classification. So, and, and actually we're gonna specifically be looking at linear separators here. I'm gonna be now assuming that there is a perfect separator. So there's a perfect linear separator, not just Bayes optimal, but, but it's perfect. We just don't know what it is. Uh, the agents, the data points, they arrive one at a time. The classifier makes a decision of positive or negative. Then the classifier finds out the correct answer. You know, uh, Were they really loan worthy or not? Uh, and we're, our goal is to minimize the number of mistakes. We'll assume that agents have the ability to manipulate, to move themselves a limited amount, uh, either an L2, so in a ball, uh, or a weighted L1, or, or, um, the cost to change feature values, uh, in, or, in, in order to be classified as positive. So kind of from a game theory or uh, uh, mechanism design point of view, think, think of agents as getting a benefit of one from being classified as positive and they have costs to move. And so they would only move if, uh, if, if A 
the, it'll get them a positive classification and B, that the, the, you know, the total cost to move is less than one, the benefit they get from being classified positive. And if they can do it, they'll do it in the cheapest way they can. Okay, so that's gonna be our assumption. Agents know the current classification rules, so it's not an issue of hiding anything. They, they, can, they can look, they can make a rational decision. Do they wanna you know, try to manipulate and pay that cost? You know, well, if it'll get them a positive classification, doing it, whereas they wouldn't get positive without doing it, well, then they'll do it. Uh, sorry, I, I didn't get what they are like manipulating. Sorry, what is the, uh, what okay, is the action space? Good, good. So the action space. Oh. Um, there is no action. Oh, Dan, I see that you are moving. But right, I I'm moving, but we seem to have lost Avram. Avram is frozen. All right. Hmm. Maybe I shouldn't have asked the question. Yeah, apparently. <laughs> um, because that wasn't in his programming, and we now know that this is not actually Avram. This was... Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Okay. Huh. Oh, that looks worse now. Yeah, he left. Maybe. Maybe. Sometimes it, uh, it looks worse, and then it gets better. Uh, So I, uh, so when he talked about the ma uh, management measure, uh -huh. what was that, right? So I, I, I just remember that uh, in some universities they were counting the number of IEEE fellows and those kind of things, uh, and then you know suddenly all the professors wanted to be fellow of ICM and I. Right? <laughs> <laughs> if you're right, if you tell people you know this is how you're going to measure, then of course they're going to maximize that. Yes. Um. It's a similar problem with universe with ranking universities. Yes, right. Um, and for that's one reason that people doing the ranking like to say we're going to keep the way we do the ranking secret. Right, so that he can right. So, but that uh, that can lead to it being even more obnoxious. I'm not right. You, you then you don't know right. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Let me see if he sent any email. Mm -hmm. Uh, is Emily on the? Yeah. Is she, is she here? Okay. Oh. But yeah, this is worse than usual for losing someone. Maybe. Huh. Yeah. Um. This is uh, okay. Hmm. I hope that he knows. I'm sure he does, because if he's not on this um, call, then he can tell. Right. I hope that he's not giving the talk. <laughs> well, no, we're not here. I think. Right. Him. That's what I'm doing. Go ahead and email him. Yeah, that's I, what I'm doing. Yeah. I'm emailing him. Yeah, I'm, I, sent, I just sent an email to him. Oh, OK. Yeah. And unfortunately, I don't have his number. So, you know. Now how to reach him. Hmm. Yeah, I have not prepared anything. 
otherwise I would have continued the, the presentation. <laughs> So is there a paper that we could look at? Uh, good question. Let's see. I, he said, he mentioned it at the beginning, but I don't think I wrote down what it was from. Let's look at, it should be something. Oh, right, look at his web. He might even yeah. have a web page. Yeah, I think it's a UC paper this year, so we must be able to find. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there is a strategic uh, perceptron. Yeah, strategic classification, I think. Okay, I see. Mm -hmm. Oh. Yeah, it has all the authors that he mentioned, yes. Uh -huh. So. See, and Jaron points out the same talk was given at IAS, which means we should be able to watch a video of everything <laughs> except the answer to a means question. <laughs> right. It, it may not have the answer, yeah, exactly, to the question. So, um, uh. Yeah, interesting. We have never had this, right? So we should have. Ah, oh, there we go. Hey. 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 Oh, wait, Avram is muted, but. Yeah. Hi, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, my, my internet just, it just died, I guess. Yeah. One of the, maybe I should have gone to my office. <laughs> <laughs> right. So no, they're, sorry they're about that. Me. They're blaming me for asking the question. No, no, it's it's it was. Uh, yeah, yeah, I guess that's right. That's what happened, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. The internet got so mad. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. Let, let me let me get back. I, um, and uh, to this. Um, here. Oh, you're the, uh, Emily. Can can you make him the? Uh, yeah. Okay. Good. All set. Excellent. Here we go. Okay. Um, sorry about that. Good. Okay. So here we go. Yeah. So so the 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 um, so let, let me give some examples. So I think that'll that'll also help. So let's imagine here here we have a case of. Uh, uh, there are two features, and let's say that agents can manipulate, they, they can change their x1 value, their horizontal, by up to 0.9 within the amount they're willing to do, but they just can't change the x2 value. It's not something they can change. So here they are, and let's imagine we see this data point, it just cycles. Let's say, you know, see these three points cycling over and over. So this is linearly separable data, okay? And there's a standard algorithm, say the perceptron algorithm for, for learning online a linear separator, um, but in the presence of this manipulation, even though the data is linearly separable, this algorithm could make an unbounded number of mistakes because it'll, it'll cycle. So here's what will happen. The way, if you're familiar with the way the algorithm works, it waits, it sees its first positive example. Let's say it's this guy at one comma zero, and then it sets that to be its separator, uh, the vector one comma zero. And now <coughs> say the negative example comes along. So it's negative but it's gonna move because it can move up to 0.9. So it's gonna actually move to the boundary, get itself a positive classification. The algorithm will see it made a mistake. The algorithm thinks it's here. And so it's gonna take that and subtract that example from its current classifier producing this classifier. Now this positive comes along and it can't move. It has to move a distance of one to be classified as positive, but it can't go that far. It can only go 0.9. That's how far it can go within its budget. So it'll just stay put because it'd rather not move at all. Why pay if you're not going to get any benefit? It'll stay put. The classifier makes a mistake. You add that and you're back to where you were. And so if we see those, those, the, these two examples over and over again, we'll just keep making mistakes on them. 
even though there exists a perfect classifier. So this is a, a perfect classifier in this sense, because this positive would manipulate here and correctly be classified as positive, whereas that negative would have to move too far and wouldn't be able to do it. And the same thing can happen if you imagine that folks can manipulate an L2 ball, say a ball of radius 0.5, actually the same example works as before. You'd start here, the negative would manipulate, you would go to here, the positive would not be able to because this is too far, that's root two over two distance, and it can only move 0.5, which is less than root two over two, so it'll just stay put and you'll get back to here. Whereas again, this would be a perfect classifier. This positive would be able, that's cheaper than one half to move to here, whereas the negative couldn't move, it's too far. So this is just examples of, of what could happen in this case. Okay, so, so by manipulating, I mean just moving their location by the amount they're allowed to. That's how they manipulate it. Okay, so, so the algorithm could cycle even though there's a perfect solution. So what I'm gonna do is just super quickly since I, I um, uh, um, you know, we lost a little bit of time, but I, I just wanna give a show how we can take this ability to strategize into account in our algorithm. Now, let me take a, a case of L2 manipulation. Let me assume that the radius, the amount that can manipulate is known. You can put a wrapper around it and learn that, but let's just assume we know it. We'll assume there's a perfect classifier in the event of no manipulation. So for instance, here would be a perfect classifier if there was no manipulation. And in fact, that means that there is also a perfect classifier with manipulation, namely just shifting it by our units. You just take something that would be perfect without, shift it by your units that way, and now it'll be perfect with manipulation because everybody can do the same amount. So you just say, look, you know, I know that recommendation letters are kind of shaded, so I'm just gonna lift my bar this amount so that, you know, to get back to where I was if people weren't manipulating. Okay, and our goal is to find a classifier that's, you know, close to this target one. So let me just kind of show how, how we can do that. Um, if you're familiar with the perceptron algorithm analysis, what we want to do is that every time we make a mistake, we need to learn something from it. And in particular, what our goal is, is if we ever make a mistake on some X, we want to be able to find some, let me call it X tilde, with the property that it has a positive dot product with the thing we're looking for, W star, but a zero or negative product dot product with the thing that we currently have, W, and then by adding this in, it'll actually improve our classifier. Okay. So how can we do this? I'm gonna start, there's gonna be like a few cases where all of them are easy except the last one. So let's start with the first easy case. So we're gonna predict negative. We see the first positive example, we initialize to that. Okay, we're gonna shift our classifier over by our units and that's what we're gonna use. Now, what do we do when we see a mistake? So easy case number one is what do we do if we make a mistake on a positive point that's to the left of the purple line it has a negative dot product with our vector w. Well, this guy must not have manipulated because you'd be crazy to manipulate and still be classified as negative. You know, why put in the effort? So at that point, you know, it has a negative dot product with us. It has a positive dot product with w star. After all, it's a positive example. We can just up, up, update using it directly. Great, easy case number one. How about a mistake on a positive point with that's between the purple and blue lines. It has a positive dot product with our classifier, but it's just not far enough. Okay, this would be problematic because it does not satisfy the conditions we're looking for. It has a positive dot product with our W, not a negative one. Luckily, this should never happen. Why? Because if you started here, you would have moved here. And if you started somewhere else, why would you move here and still get yourself a negative classification? So this should never happen. And moreover, if it does happen, that means your guess of the radius R was wrong, and you can use it for doing binary search for finding the right value of R. We're assuming here that everybody has the same value of R, and that's clearly a very strong assumption. Okay, what about a mistake on a negative point that's strictly to the right of the blue line? Well, that guy must not have manipulated because why would you manipulate more than you need to? You would just manipulate the smallest amount you need to. So again, that case is fine. You can just update using it directly, which means what? Which means you flip it through the origin and you use that as your X tilde. So this negative had a negative dot product with W star, positive with us, we flip it. It's now this X tilde has a positive dot product with W star, negative with us, we can use it. 
Okay, the last case, and the case that actually matters and where this is what's causing the original algorithm to go wrong, is a negative point that's right on our blue line. Now, the problem is this guy came from somewhere and we don't know exactly where. So what we're going to do is we're going to pull it back to the purple line and then flip it through the origin, and then we're going to update using that. Okay, so this has a zero dot product with W. It's on our purple line. So by design, it's zero dot product with our current W. But why does it have a positive dot product with the W star with the, the correct separator we're looking for? Okay, that has to be argued. To argue that, we're going to use the fact that by induction, the classifier W that we're using always has a positive dot product with the thing that we're searching for, this W star. We're not exactly right, but at least we have a positive dot product with it. And that's maintained by induction. Okay, let me just state that uh, without proof. And that helps, why? Because where did this negative that we're seeing come from? It came from somewhere. It would have moved directly perpendicular to our blue line because everybody wants to manipulate in the cheapest way possible. So it's going to come directly here. But we just don't know. It could have come as far back as the purple line or somewhere in between. And we're moving it back to the purple line. Now, moving it back to the purple line could be moving it a little too far back. But that's OK, because moving it back too far is subtracting a little bit too much of W from it. But since W and W star have a positive dot product, when we subtract a little more W, we're subtracting a little more W star also. We're making this guy even more negative than it has to be, making this guy even more positive than it has to be. So everything is still OK. All right, I did that fast. But, but basically, that's kind of the way the, the analysis goes. And you can extend this to known weighted L1 costs. Uh, it's just. Now, now the agents aren't going to manipulate perpendicular. They're going to manipulate according to the cheapest coordinate direction. Um, you need, if you know the cost, you can figure out what direction they manipulate in. If you don't know the cost, it's more involved, and we can only handle that if there's a small number of directions we don't know. But that's that's roughly what we can do. Okay, so since I'm uh, hitting time, uh, let me just summarize. So we're examining a classic online learning problem online learning of a linear classifier in a stylized strategic environment. Uh, agents' actions change as the classifier changes, and that can cause standard algorithms like perceptron to cycle indefinitely. Uh, but we can derive manipulation-aware algorithms that succeed in the case that manipulation costs are known, or at least there's not too many unknowns. And uh, I just it's a, it's a nice open problem here that uh, I assume there was a perfect classifier. Um, normally with perceptron, you can get a bound in terms of the hinge loss, and you can still do that in terms of the hinge loss of the points you see. But what you really want is a bound in terms of the hinge loss of the points before they moved, because what you see depends on what you're doing. So, so you know, getting a bound in terms of what you see is kind of not so exciting if what you're doing is causing what you see to look bad. And you'd really like to get a bound in terms of the true hinge loss. We have examples showing that the algorithms that we know don't work and we don't have a good algorithm that works in that case. It's also interesting to consider other manipulation models, classification functions, and so on. So, okay, so that's it. So thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we still have a few minutes, uh, I guess, if people have questions. Um, and, but, uh, you know, we also, understand that some people have to leave in order to get to their classes. Um, so I, so here for the, uh, just for the online um, perceptron, right? Mm -hmm. um, is there any version that you can think of, like you have nonlinear classifiers, but there is one that is uh, uh, with error zero, in your class? Uh, yeah, so, so one interesting thing is that there are a lot of kind of variations that normally are sort of trivial reductions, but now it's more complicated. Like, let's yeah. consider even something simpler. I'm assuming that there's a perfect classifier through the origin for the non manipulated data. Okay. Uh, now, it may what not if, be a good what about shifting that not through the origin? Well, normally that's a easy thing. You just create yeah. an extra fake feature and give everybody yeah. a coordinate one in that feature. Yeah. Well, now notice that that's a non-manipulating feature. 
people can't right. change it. So they're no longer moving in an L2 ball. They're moving an L2 ball, except that one's fixed, right? Yes. And, yes. and actually, it's, it's, you, so you can handle that case, but it's not a direct reduction anymore. Mm -hmm. And actually, you can show if you try to do the direct reduction, you can actually make this algorithm cycle indefinitely again, because it's not a, you know, doing the right thing. Right. Yeah. So, um, so unfortunately, like you might just like, can we use a kernel? Right. All yeah. those things. It's interesting because the the manipulation you have to care. Okay, well, what does that mean in the kernel space? So, so yeah, I don't know of a good clean way to handle those sort of things. I don't know any way to handle general kernels. We 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 can handle the case of linear separators that are not through the origin, but that required like not doing that reduction and instead trying right. to you know do binary search over well how much should you shift the thing, and 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 so yeah, unfortunately all the things that we know are kind of very sensitive to exactly what's the model of what people can do and how does that change you know through these reductions so yeah i think there's a lot of great questions out there um, so basically any question you ask i think the answer is going to be i don't know <laughs> so but that's what well, it's very reminiscent to also you know adversarial training right so the you, instead of right so you're yep that's right. So it's it's very much like an adversarial case, except here, right? The adversary is um, like trying to become positive. Positive, um, yeah. Right. That's right. And yeah. Uh, um, uh, yeah, that's right. So it is kind of very close to that. Um, uh -huh. Are there any other questions? Hi, Avram. I have one uh, question. So have you considered the model where maybe the agent can um, truly improve their, like say, loan worthiness, mm -hmm. uh, say for yeah. some features, but others are just gaming? Yeah, that. yeah. So actually we've been looking at that and we actually have some results. So not in the online setting. So so we, we have in, in the distributional setting, kind of I mentioned the problem as I was stated in the distributional setting, um, you could just take your data, find the classifier and shift it by our units. But mm -hmm. yeah, in, in the, we've been looking at that, right. So it, it, exactly kind of models where, yeah, maybe some directions are true improvement and other ones are more gaming directions. And so mm -hmm. now this interesting thing of what you want and what you can do, like ideally, if the correct classifier encourages people to improve, great, you just shift it and they're perfect. But what if the correct classifier is encouraging people to game? maybe there's something else you could do that would get them to improve. So like you're giving out loans and you know, it's one thing to try to classify everybody correctly, but maybe there's mm -hmm. something else you could do that would actually, like what you really want to do is you want to give out loans and you want to not give out loans to people who shouldn't get them. So you're trying to you know, keep your false positives down and mm -hmm. make your true positives you know, up. And normally right. that just means you just don't want to have a lot of mistakes. But if people can improve, then maybe you could try to do something that would actually encourage people to make themselves loan worthy. And then you'd get you know, more loans you give out. So yeah, we've been looking at those sort of things and we have some mm -hmm. results. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, yeah, I think that's a great question. I think there's a lot of really interesting things along those lines. And then, and, you know, and, and a lot of, there's been a lot of really nice work um, uh, on those sort of directions, but I think it's, um, uh, there's an there's a interesting work and in, it's called common contracts, I guess, which is kind of related where basically you're trying to, um, you know, uh, yeah, some contract for things where you can, but you have to give the same contract to everybody. And that's kind of like having the same classifier for everybody. Um, but yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a great question. It's one actually we've been think, trying to think about a lot. And I think it's, uh, yeah, the, like, there's also a lot of great questions there. Thank you. Okay, so if right. there are no more questions, um, yeah, thank you very much again for- Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, yeah, sorry about the, the internet problem. Yeah, it was just, I don't know no, what we were looking. We were looking at your paper, so that was- all. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, by the way, there's a mistake over here. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. Take care. See you all. Bye-bye.